Hello and welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, technical accounting matters, business issues, current standard setting and regulatory updates. I'm your host, Ruth Preedy. In this episode, we're going to be talking about cash flow models in the context of impairment, so IS36, impairment of non-financial assets. And helping us out with that topic, we're joined today in the podcast studio by Mary Dolson, who's one of our lead technical IFRS partners at PwC. Thanks, Ruth. Before we get into what is a cash flow model and what to look out for, let's first of all talk about what is impairment. The principle of impairment is that no asset should be carried on the balance sheet at more than its recoverable amount. And its recoverable amount is the higher of two things. So it's the higher of how much I can get from using the asset, that's my value and use, and how much I could get from selling that asset, that's the fair value, less cost of disposal. For both those values, value and use and fair value, less cost of disposal, we could need to use a cash flow model, and there's lots of things that can go wrong. So let's get started. What is a cash flow model? So a cash flow model is an estimate of the cash that's going to be generated by an asset or business over the course of its lifetime, discounted to today's value. And that's either a proxy for what cash flows are you going to get or what might a market participant be prepared to pay for your asset or business. Okay, so that's value in use is what you'll get from using it, and then fair value is what a market participant would pay. So what if you're looking at, it, when you get a cash flow model on your desk and you're reviewing it, what's your biggest bug there you're looking for? Well. So many cash flow models just have one estimate of cash flows and use whack, right? And if all you've got is management's best estimate, probably optimistic estimate of how the business is going to perform over the next few years, and that's discounted at their cost of capital, essentially you're saying, I'm going to achieve my plan. And no plan survives contact with the enemy. Things go better, things go worse. So that single point estimate of cash flows discounted the company's cost of capital. It really just doesn't incorporate enough risk. So what's the alternative? What do you think they should be doing? The alternative is to do a number of different expected outcomes. Probably minimum good practice for valuation purposes would be three. Things go amazing not so highly probable, things go terrible, also maybe not so highly probable, things go broadly as as I expect my business to perform, right? And, you know, better practice is to do more than that, but actually good practice would be to do three. And that means you, you can probability weight those scenarios, their likelihood of occurring, and it gives you a wider range of outcomes. It incorporates more risk in your cash flows. Okay, so your first top tip is move away from just having one single set of cash flows and think about maybe a probability weighted model. Yes. Okay, so where does a company even start if they're pulling together a cash flow model? Well, they would start with their latest budgets and forecasts, but they need to kind of take a deep breath and say, have we been able to reasonably forecast what's going to happen? Right. So if you go back three years in time, did we think we would be where we are today? Or, you know, even over the last year, what, what was the budget we started with? What was the budget we achieved? Some industries you can do reasonably good budgets in. Some, you know, it does seem much more difficult to, to make those estimates. Right? And that IS36 talks about, you know, that your cash flows need to be reasonable and supportable. What does that actually mean? I always say our most powerful weapon in looking at cash flow models is common sense. And so it, it, it's in some ways no more difficult to think about that than it is to think about your household budget. Right? You would never assume that your income is going to increase 10% year on year from now until the end of time. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when you look at some cash flow models, it, it, it assumes sort of growth in income that companies have never achieved in the past. And if you don't understand exactly where that growth is coming from, it's probably not reasonable or supportable. You also quite often see revenue going up and investment in fixed assets uh, going down, right? And the two seldom go together. (laughs) (laughs) And even if so, value in use, we'll we'll talk more about later, but that's how the asset is generating cash today. Should they still be looking for market data uh, to support the numbers in the cash flow? The company should have as many external inputs in their model as is consistent with VIU. So 
you know, if they're looking at how much they expect their company to grow after the end of the forecast period, so after the end of five years, they can't assume they're going to outperform the industry average or what's forecast for the industry. You can't outperform inflation, right? You can't ignore cost. I mean, if you're in a commodity business, your commodities are going to cost you what everybody else's commodities uh, are going to cost you, right? So company can't ignore market data. The more you can incorporate market data, the more that your model is robust. And so what we've talked about there is you need to start with management's forecasts and budgets. How far do you project that forward? How, how good is your crystal ball? How far can you see into the future? Right? Yes. The standard actually says, if you go beyond five years, you better, you better explain to me why you've done that. Right? And so for almost any business, I think it's really, really difficult to justify why you might have gone beyond five years. You might occasionally, if you're growing a new business or turning around a, an existing business, but it, it's, it would be very unusual to be able to explain why you can forecast out past the five years. And, and if I was the regulator, you know, inspecting your financial statements or looking at our audit work, I would say, where's your evidence that you can forecast that far into the future? If you have that good a crystal ball, you know, why aren't you, why haven't you made a fortune already and are retired on the beach somewhere? So it's that sort of, you know, What's your evidence that you can forecast out that long? And I think there's a specific disclosure requirement on IS36 as well that you need to say why you've used more than five years if you do. So in this model, we're going to project forward five years and then to reflect the life of the CGU, we're going to add a terminal value. What can go wrong in terminal value? Oh, so much. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> well, the terminal value is often 60 to 80% of the total value produced by the model. So some of the things that, that happen that go badly wrong in the terminal value is if you quite, sometimes the terminal value is extrapolated from the last specific year of projection. So you go out five years, you take year five and you say, okay, this is my basis for forecasting things into the future. So the first thing you have to do is make sure that that five year, that, that year of cash flows is a sustainable year, right? So any kind of little budges or manipulations or strange things in that. So if, for example, in that year, CapEx exceeds depreciation, yeah. right? you basically said, I'm going to grow and consume my asset base at the same time. Right? If you say, okay, in year five, I'm going to put a squeeze on working capital. So my working capital, despite the fact I'm projecting a growing business, working capital is going to contribute to cash flows. You replicate that into, into perpetuity. So you really have to be what is sustainable over the long term. And everything regresses to the norm. So even if you can squeeze working capital once in a while and get a bump, actually it norms itself back up pretty quickly. So any abnormal amounts in that last year effectively? Any unusual gain. Projected into perpetuity. Yeah, and, and basically multiplied. Right? Yeah. And, and you get, when you look at the outcome of some of these terminal values, or when you look at what's implied in the terminal value, you know, sometimes it, it's hard not to sort of fall off your chair because you know you might have then implied in your terminal value is that you you've sold cell phones to three times as many people as there are on the planet right so you know at some point you basically run out of out of demand for your product so you need a common sense test exactly. in there as well what does the terminal value imply mainly about market share and about your ability to price because businesses that generate premium cash flows attract competition and what we've seen over my career certainly is the business cycle accelerates. So you have a market entrant, somebody thinks up a new thing like Uber or Amazon and, or Netflix, right? And immediately you then have competition. So my youngest son was talking about how his favorite thing used to be to go put the video back in the blockbuster return box. Yeah. And, and so in his lifetime, he's 18, video stores rose and died. Like yeah. as an industry, it rose and died and it's gone, yeah. right? So it's like nostalgic for him and he's 18 years old. Yeah. And did, I'm sure he wants to put toast in the machine as well or something. Well, he actually put a toast. He, he, yeah. It was one of our other children who put a slice of toast in the video. <laughs> yes. I'm letting out all your secrets. Um, I suppose the other thing that I see a lot in terminal value is they'll always put a growth rate. So what growth do they think they're going to get forever? So what do they need to watch out for there? Growth can't be higher than the long-term expectation of inflation. A couple of reasons, right? The economy can't grow at that rate forever, right? 
and and also this this point about you attract your own competition. The more successful you are, the more that you have competitors chasing you. Yeah. And what does that do? It starts to introduce price cuts. I remember when a, a flat screen TV cost twenty thousand pounds. Yeah. Now people don't bother to steal them. <laughs> okay, so I think we we know how long we're projecting for. We know what to look out for in the terminal value. One of the first things we talked about is you're looking at your asset and you're comparing what cash flows you could get from using it, the value in use, against what you could sell it for, the fair value. Are they the same thing? No, there's a really interesting misperception about how flexible they are. Value in use is not any old number you can make up, right? Value in use is actually testing the asset that you have today with the decisions that you've made about that asset or business. So it says you can't incorporate the cash outflows or the cash benefits of a restructuring program if you haven't met the IS37 criteria to recognize the restructuring provision on the balance sheet. So it says test the asset you have today, but assume that you're continuing to use it and it's going to generate cash flows in your business. So maybe there are synergies or market advantages that only you have access to, right? Fair value says, Think about how much you could sell this for to somebody else, right? And so if you're going to sell your business to somebody else, maybe they have the institutional will to take on a, a big uh, redundancy that you can't do or won't do, right? Or maybe they're prepared to offshore all of your manufacturing. or So the market might see that there's value in that business that you haven't unlocked. And that's why sometimes you get a difference between what the market says and what the company is prepared to say. Okay, so... Value in use, if you, you have to look at the asset's current state, yes. whereas for fair value, you could potentially presume a market participant would restructure yep. or enhance. Yep. Okay, so we talked a lot about cash flows and things we need to look out for. I have lots of discussions in practice about what discount rate should I Always use. too low. <laughs> <laughs> Add on more. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's, that's very facile, but... A company, so the starting point for many engagement teams seems to be WAC, right? Yeah. And WAC is okay to measure, say, an enterprise value. So an enterprise, a business, is a collection of not risky assets like the building you're sitting in, right? Because yeah. you could always sell your building to somebody else probably, you know, and, and generate a return. But cash is a low-risk asset, yeah. for example. And riskier assets like a brand name or Goodwill or something that customer can, relationships, customer relationships right? All you you know, you you do the wrong thing at the wrong moment and you can destroy brand value and goodwill and customer relationships almost overnight these days. So those are riskier assets. So you have to make sure that your discount rate, if you're testing risky assets, startup a startup business is probably a a riskier business than an established business. Although, I don't know, in today's market, sometimes the startups seem to be really outperforming the outstanding. But you have to understand what it is you're testing and choose a discount rate that's high enough to provide the risk. And also, if you've only gone for a single point estimate of cash flows, you've not put very much risk into your cash flows. Therefore, your discount rate has to assume some risk. Yeah. Incorporate that. So going back to your first tip about thinking about using probability weighted cash flows, which doesn't put then as much emphasis on the discount rate. It's less strain on the discount yeah. rate. The discount rate is a frail vessel to carry that much over. <laughs> so. so just the last thing before we close out this podcast is if we're thinking about preparing our financial statements, obviously our users and our regulators are going to be looking at our disclosure. What do you see people missing in disclosure or poor disclosures that you could give some tips on? Assume that the regulator can read the disclosure requirements in the standard, go through the list, and make the disclosures when it's required. Right? Key assumptions. Assumptions are things like, we assumed our business was going to grow for 10% for the next five years, and then it's going to grow at the rate of inflation after that. That's a key assumption. I'm going to be able to reduce costs, uh, and I'm going to do that through, you know, whatever, increasing automation, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm expecting to take 2% of my cost out of my business year on year, up to year five, and after that it's going to warm up. Those are key assumptions. Right? The other thing I think is that, is it a significant source of measurement uncertainty? So we've had low oil prices, in particular low commodity prices in general, for about three years now. And so in the oil and gas community, people talk about lower for longer. 
and how do you think about those prices? And you see some companies, particularly where their reserves are mature, where if the price moves by five dollars, right, it has a very, very substantial in- impact on the output, on the outcome of their of their modeling, right? So. We've actually seen a number of oil and gas companies say a reasonably possible change in my assumption, i.e. the price falls by another 5%, would produce a material impairment. So that's the, you know, the IS-1 measurement of uncertainty requirement. It's not in 36, that's in IS-1 itself. Yeah. The other thing I think for people to watch out for, if you have got reduced headroom, so where you're carrying them out and you're a couple amount are very close, there are additional requirements especially around near sensitivities miss. near yeah. miss exactly there need to be additional disclosures there okay any parting thoughts mary any advice for someone preparing a cash flow model it's always easier to defend a prudent model that perhaps is risk averse when you're talking to your regulator or even talking to your auditors right it's just an easier conversation Also, companies should understand what their impairment testing process is and where the inputs come from and not be trying to do it in anger when they think they have an impairment, right? So so it's plan, execute your plan, accept the outcome. Have good sources of data. So for all the, the the inputs for your model, know what's reasonable market data, do a bit of benchmarking and see if you're on track. Make assumptions that survive common sense. And um, make sure that you're comparing business you own with the cash flows it's going to generate. So make sure you're comparing apples and apples. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Mary, on your top tips on cash flow models. We hope you found them useful. Um, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Thank you for joining. And today we've covered cash flow models for non-financial assets under IS36. For more information, you can visit pwc.com slash IFRS where you can find our latest publications. I'm Ruth Preedy. Happy accounting. Enjoy your day in the world of IFRS. The preceding program was brought to you by Price Waterhouse Coopers LLP. This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.